It's an honor to be here at SOAS. Um, my first time, actually, at uh, this prestigious place. Uh, Lars has guided me around in the maze-like structures here, but uh, so I have been totally confused, but that's fine. Uh, happy that so many could come tonight uh, and to listen to this topic. This is a sort of a hopeless topic. Uh, Swedish missionaries in China, 1847 It's 100 years, so well, more than 700 people and, and 18 provinces, etc., etc. So I will not be able to speak about everything. If you read the, the blurb uh, introducing the, the lecture, you will see that I have chosen to talk a bit about uh, uh, the peripheries or the non-Chinese aspects of Swedish mission to China, but Mongolians, Tibetans, and Uyghurs, but also at the towards the end a bit about uh, Swedish uh, missionaries' interactions with the Communist Party. Uh, intriguing uh, uh, connections that I've stumbled upon. So the first image, uh, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of images uh, taken by Swedish missionaries, collected, sent back to Sweden and stored in various archives, in the national archives and in the church, different church archives. And most of them are not accessible, they're not digitized. It's a it's a it's a gold mine for anyone looking for anything. China, there are lots and lots of them just showing ordinary life in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Even a few uh, film clips. They did bring some film cameras. There is even a few film clips from Xinjiang in the 1920s and 30s, which is quite rare of, of daily life among the Uyghurs or Turkeys, uh, as they would call them at that time. I'm, I'm not able to show that here, but. I've chosen this image to start with because this is one of the images that, that caught my attention early on. There, I didn't find that, that the even better one where you can see the missionaries speaking as well. But these are Polpatur uh, missionaries in, in central uh, Chinese Hubei province. They're Chinese porters carrying uh, uh, boxes with, with Bible uh, uh, portions. And in this image is from 1905. It goes along with a wonderful story about them preaching. Uh, or after having the local evangelist preaching, actually, because they were quite new, these missionaries who, who, who brought all these books. They didn't speak very good Chinese anymore, but it was a bit chaotic. And in the uh, recording, uh, uh, the personal recording of this, this event, uh, the evangelist had to, to shout to silence the population and say, Oh, are there, aren't there any good people around here in this town? It's in Delhi, in, in Hubei province, in the southern tip of Hubei province, towards Hula. Uh, and then one man stepped forward. He was a baker. He told them, do you have the, the do you have Genesis? It's a wonderful book. I bought it when I was traveling once. And it's, do you have it? Yes, we have the book of Genesis here. But why do you want to read Genesis? Oh, it tells us about how God created heaven and earth, etc., etc. And then they sold all their books of Genesis. Presumably in one of these boxes. So the, the story is fantastic. And then I found these images from this event. So that, that's sort of what you can find when you dig deep into this marvelous archive that we have. Uh, you may have heard this name, Theodore Hambai. He has two Chinese names. Uh, I'm not sure which one is most common, but he is considered the first Swedish missionary to China. Uh, he did work for the Basel mission, or the Chongzhou Hui, as it's called nowadays. Uh, to, uh, have churches in Hong Kong, for example. Uh, but he was inspired by Peter Fjell's death, who was a pure into Scandinavian church history, he would know this name as, as a, he was actually sent by the, the, the Church Missionary Society to India. Uh, he started in Basel, and then he was sent by the British Church Missionary Society to India, where he was not healthy, he went, came back to Sweden. But he was a great missionary inspirer, very early one. And he inspired this man to go to Basel and then on to Hong Kong. His claim to fame is that he, in Hong Kong in 1852, he met Wong Rengan. Uh, I think some of you know who Wong Rengan was. Anyone? He was the, um, he was the cousin of Hong Xiuquan, the one of the wise kings of the Taiping uh, Empire. Uh, I don't remember, he, was, he was, had sort of a prime ministerial role, I think, in the Taiping Kingdom, the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom. But he, 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 was on, on, he was escaping from, from the fighting, um, and he came to Hong Kong to seek refuge. And he stumbled upon this man who taught him about the Bible, and who taught him the Gospels and, and Christian teachings, and who baptized him. So 
uh, at least one of the Taipei people were baptized by a Buddhist missionary uh, in, a, in a classical Lutheran Baptist tradition. Uh, and then he left Hong Kong and went back and became one of the vice kings of the Taipei Kingdom. Uh, and from his interactions with Hong Rekha, uh, Hamburg wrote a, a collection, a book, The Chinese Rebel Chief Hong Xiuquan and the Origin of the Insurrection in China, who caused quite a, a stir when it came out in 1855, the year after he died. It was actually printed and published sort of a, a block away from here. Uh, I looked up the, the publisher and it, they had their, their offices sort of two blocks from here or something. Um, so he, there was a sort of, um, he was also working with uh, uh, Karl Gützler, who was uh, uh, later uh, much criticized and, and questioned a German missionary. They, 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 they didn't go well together, uh, so they split up. So he worked on his own for the Basel mission. Uh, he was soon accompanied by two other missionaries, Karl Josef Fast and uh, Anders Elkist. Uh, let's see, we have a, yeah. Norton and Mabel uh, was just a yeah. uh, The Church of Sweden, as you might have heard about, is, is, is the national church, the former state church of Sweden. But they didn't start any China mission for real until 1917. But in 1849, uh, uh, the Lund Missionary Society, a Lutheran society within the Church of Sweden, sent two people to Hong Kong as well, hearing about Hamburg and what he's been doing, uh, trying to start the mission uh, for real. Uh, Fast went on his own to Fuzhou in Fujian, where after a couple of months, he was killed on a boat trip when Elkvist was there to visit him. Elkvist jumped in the water and survived. They were attacked by just sort of local pirates or some people trying to, 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 to rob them. Uh, and then he went home. That was the, the end of their very early mission, and then Hamburg died. And then nothing happened for 30 years. So while Sweden was in, in a process of, of revival, there was a lot of revivals from the 1840s, the Baptists and, and also early Methodists coming to Sweden, and then other pietist revivals that inspired a, a, a big a church movement in Sweden, also against the, the Church of Sweden, the state church. Uh, a liberation from, from what they experienced to be imposed uh, uh, rules for, for religious life, you could say. Uh, so the start was sort of more glamorous with Hamburg, who met the uh, and Gan, and he, he's still the, this book is actually the first, one of the few books written at the time about the Taiping uh, Rebellion. Uh, it's still, still quoted sometimes uh, when people write about the Taiping Rebellion, because it's the first, and it's a, it's a source directly yes. into the Taiping Rebellion. Which is very unusual. Uh, so, this is past uh, a tombstone in, in Bujo, all demolished now in the 1960s, the Cultural Revolution. That there was a, a Christian cemetery was demolished in that so There's nothing left of this, this, this efforts. Uh, there's nothing left of Hamburg's efforts either. I was asked by someone, oh, do you have a memorial for Hamburg in, in Stockholm or, or so and so and so? <laughs> no, I, I don't. Can, can I come and visit and see where you lived? Is this a plaque on the wall? And to know a black on the wall, 99.99% uh, of people in Sweden has no idea who Hamburg was or past or Elkist. You have to be a, a Lutheran and, and a missionary, person with missionary interest to know anything about it. So the topic for today is uh, Swedish missionaries, and there were many of them. They had an enormous presence during a long time, but it's a very much forgotten topic also in Sweden. I will mention a few names that are important among the, the early ones. After these uh, 30 years had passed in the 1880s, uh, the China Indian Mission had started. Uh, Hudson Taylor was traveling around in Europe, inspiring people. He came to Sweden as well. He inspired many in Sweden, including this man, Erik Folke, Li Kai, his Chinese name. Uh, he went to China in 1887 to study at the China Indian Mission School in Anqi. Uh, uh, Gang King, if you have read the old materials. Um, and he founded his own missionary society. Well, some people did it for him while he was in China in 1888, the Rui Huahui, the Swedish mission to China. And he worked in, in China in, in two periods. Uh, he's quite well known and praised as a missionary, but he was also actually the first Swedish sonologist, I would say, autodidact. He didn't study at any university. He learned Chinese himself, and he translated classical texts. 
道德经、诗经、书经、礼记 ，and 孝经 all came out in 1908, except for these ones, but the full Tao Te Ching. One year before, the Swedish famous sonologist uh, Bernard Kolgren, Gauben Han, started his studies of Chinese in 1909 in, in, in St. Petersburg. So this is actually the first British sonologist, I would say, with a, with a higher level of cultural and, and, and linguistic knowledge, and a missionary leader at the same time. Very unusual. It was a, 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 a typical thing with Swedish missionaries in China and, and elsewhere, I would say, is they have very low educational level. They have a primary school education, a few had a middle school education. Until uh, recent times, this was the case. Uh, they had their own magazine, The Land of Sinning. So what is the Sinning? Anyone recognize this? What is Sinning? Have you read your Isaiah recently? <laughs> Chapter 49, <laughs> verse 12. <laughs> Anyone can recite it? Let's try <laughs> Well, it's a lost tribe, but it's sort of, they should come from east and from west and from afar, and even from the land of Sinim. That's the old translations in many languages, English, German, Swedish. And this was, aha, Sinim must be China. Even the, the Union, Chinese Union version from 1919 has Qin in early versions. Now, nowadays, it's a footnote of people. Qin, like the, the first empress in the dynasty. Uh, so they choose this, and they, they published this magazine until 1919. 81, where they merged with other organizations to form a new missionary, still existing organization. If you, if you see that, if it's, there are Chinese characters, it may look like it's only a sort of a decoration, but it says, Ye he hua yi la, and yi bian yi shor. Anyone know this? There's no explanation. So hardly anyone who read this can understand what this means. I think Lars knows, I think you're mumbling. Yeah, yeah. Jehovah Jireh. Yeah. You know this. It's from, it's from uh, I have to look. Uh, it's Genesis 22. <laughs> the Lord will provide. And this is Ebenezer. Uh, Stone of help. Uh, so the, this is sort of part of the image making, I suppose, with characters and, and things like that. But no one can understand it. They didn't even explain it. This is the first issue in 1896. Uh, this is the translation of Ogranzo. The only in Swedish, the Swedish language of the of the Trumpse text until uh, Joran Malmqvist, the, the late now late professor of Chinese studies in Stockholm, published posthumously in 19, in twenty twenty his own translation. So for almost hundred years, this was the only translation published in a very minor publishing house, not and, and not selling very well. Uh, only a few copies in, in libraries here and there. So. He, he was really very, very important and sort of driving even China studies. Uh, I have to mention one more name. And this is this man, Felix Branson, who was actually, he was in China once. So he was never a China missionary. Uh, but he, when, when Hudson Taylor in that time called for a thousand new missionaries to China, he replied directly, oh, I will, I will send 100 from Sweden. It's sort of Bit too much, but he grew up in a in a in a very uh, pious family outside Nura in central Sweden, and his family emigrated to the USA in 1869, as many Swedes did. Over a million Swedes emigrated to the US from 1867 until the 1920s. Over a million people. Sweden had sort of five million population at the time. So, so Swedish presence in, in the US has a long history. Um, but he was an important inspirer for China mission. He, he started a number of organizations, he inspired even, even more. Uh, he was sort of an extreme, he was a premillennialist, believing that Christ would come back before the next millennium, which he didn't, but even the next millennium. Uh, but, um, he was also an ecumenist, and he worked with Dwight Moody, who might be a familiar name for you. Moody never went to Sweden, but he's extremely popular, he was in Sweden until mid 20th century, his text and songs and everything. So there's some strange connection here between this man and Moody and inspiring mission. Uh, so even though he only went to China once to have a look, sort of and visit the missionaries, he, he had a strong influence on the Mongol mission that I will mention later, the Swedish Alliance mission, the Scandinavian Alliance mission, who is now the, the Evangelical Alliance mission in the US team. Swedish Holiness Union uh, mission organization in Denmark and Germany is still active. So I think six or seven organizations was founded or inspired by his work. 
doing mission in not only in China but all over the world actually. Um, so a name, a list of names for all the Swedish China mission organizations. Only only the Swedish mission to China, the Swedish Mongol mission, and uh, yeah, those are the only two that only worked in China. All the others had missionaries all around the globe. Uh, over 700 missionaries from Sweden worked in China during 100 years. Uh, maybe more, 750, maybe 800. It's difficult to count. If you count all the Swedish Americans who just had left Sweden to the, go to the US and they came back to Sweden and went to China. <laughs> if you add that, there might be even more. And as I said, Sweden had a population of about four or five million. So the per capita uh, balance here is Sweden must have been the country sending most missionaries to China per capita. Far ahead of any other country. Um, these, some of these were big, the Mission Covenant Church, they had 100 and, uh, uh, how many were 180 missionaries in China for over 100 years. Uh, Alliance Mission also, something like that, 100 missionaries, Pentecostals, about 100 missionaries. The other ones, 30, 40, 50, perhaps. Uh, they also had over 100 missionaries. Um, all together about 700. And there were Swedes, of course, in the Christian Mission to Buddhists, the YMCA, Christian Missionary Alliance, Salvation Army. Have you been to a Wang Fujing in Beijing? Have you seen something peculiar? At, I don't remember the number, 27 perhaps? A gray building with a sort of hourish structure. It's a church where it's actually the former Salvation Army Central Corps in Beijing. It was led by a Swede in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, I didn't know this until a few years back. I, I knew that the place in Beijing, but I didn't know there was a Swede who was the leader of it in, in the 20s and 30s. He's totally unknown in Sweden. Uh, you know Tsuo Tsung Tang? Anyone know? The, you know the, Tso, the, the, the general Tsuo's chicken, I suppose. <laughs> but that has nothing to do with him and, or anything Chinese, but his name, the Tsuo Tsung Tang, was the Qing Dynasty general. Uh, he died in 1880 something. His mansion, uh, when the Swedish, uh, the Church of Sweden, the first missionaries, they worked for the YWCA in, in Changsha, and they occupied this, this mansion to start the first YWCA station in Changsha. It's sort of mind boggling. How could they even access this, this, this mansion? So there's a lot of peculiar things happening. A map, uh, these are the Short forms in Swedish, the Mongol mission, of course, are here. This is the Mission Covenant Church of Sweden. I will talk about more about that very special uh, uh, effort in, in, in Xinjiang, about the Uyghurs. But then the, the P is for the Pentecostals that were spread out. Uh, Mong Mongols among Tibetans in Yunnan and in Chengdu for a while in, in big cities. Uh, Church of Sweden, only in Hunan province, where they tried to have their own university. It didn't work out very well. Um, but mostly centered here in, in sort of central areas. Uh, some of these are very small. The the Federal Mission, the Holiness Union, uh, had a few stations. The Free Baptist Society as well. But the the Swedish Mission to China, the Mission Covenant Church, spread out all over so over a number of of places in in, in central China. Uh, I mentioned it's the largest China mission of any country. The strong revival movements. Uh, I suspect that the, the reason for so many Swedes wanting to leave Sweden was that they wanted to escape poverty. Sweden was a poor country. Very simple uh, answer to, to the, how could they send so many missionaries? There was a revival, they were more or less zealous, but an adventure. Uh, in 1842, uh, the Swedish government. Uh, uh, mandated uh, public schooling. There was a, 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 a free uh, a primary school for uh, boy, both boys and girls, compulsory up to six years, which after a few decades had an enormous impact on, on the general literacy, of course, and the sort of general knowledge about the world can read newspapers and books and things like that. It was a big change in the 1850s and 60s. And this, of course, opened people's minds up so that you can travel, and traveling was easier. That was, a, that was a, a factor, but also for women. There were huge amounts of women among the missionaries, and they had not much choices. Higher education was prohibited up in the 1920s in Sweden for women generally. Uh, they could become nurses, midwives, teachers perhaps, 
or missionaries. And then they can be all of this. They can be missionary and midwife and nurse and teacher, and they can see another part of the world. Uh, numbers of many examples of how Swedish women went to, to China or to other Africa, and they became uh, principals of schools, they, they led hospitals, they had a totally different life what they could do in Sweden. It was totally the opposite. Uh, I said they had only primary school education, they, they might have been carpenters, they might have been farmers, uh, farm hands even, not even other farmers by, their, by themselves. But then they went into missionary seminaries of schools. I wouldn't say theological seminaries, but missionary seminaries. Uh, they didn't learn much languages. Actually, where I grew up in the west part of Sweden, in Stinaham, a small town by the Lake Vernon, the, the first mission school or the mission covenant church was placed there. Uh, for a couple of decades, and they even brought uh, local people from Central Asia, from China, back to Sweden to teach at this school. So they couldn't go to a university, or they didn't have, didn't have money to do that, but they could go to the church mission school, where they actually, some, for, for, for periods, had Turkish-speaking people coming. Uh, a very special example is Johannes Avetaranya, right in the Armenian name, but he was a um, Turkish mullah called uh, Mehmet Shukri from, from Turkey, converted to Christianity. And he was sent as a missionary to Xinjiang to, to the mission in, in Kashgar. He was for a while in my hometown, actually, uh, learning, uh, teaching Turkic languages in a small town in Western Sweden that no one else heard about. This is quite unusual, I would say. And some of them turned into, I would say, practical zoologists. Uh, this might be a strange term, but uh, they had a profound knowledge, they knew the language, they learned some about history, and they had a, a local knowledge about the place where they worked, and respect for that. And one effect of this is, is something that, that we, we lose to get today. We, have, we pick up our phones and we Google something, and then we lose it. We don't remember it, maybe, uh, because we, we know it's always here. But a, a person in, in, let's say, far out in the countryside in Sweden or in, in anywhere else actually in, in the West uh, who was, had mission interest in, in this time, in late 19th century, who read the missionary reports, read the missionary newspapers. They could know a lot about a specific place like Marchen in Hubei province, for example. How many of you know Ma Marchen? You're from Hubei? No, no. <laughs> so, and if, if you're from China, you would know Martin because of his revolutionary heritage today. Mm -hmm. Like people like uh, not Lin Biao, he's from South Bay, but uh, Dong Biu is from Martin area. But people in, in Sweden in 1895, they would know what Martin was. They know about the customs in that area, and, and no one knows about Martin today. You might pass it on the high speed train nowadays, but the train won't stop. But it goes by that, the, 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 the Beijing Hong Kong line. Uh, what I show here is what's in the collections in Swedish archives. This is actually a land deed or, or a rental agreement. There's something here about the Fu Yin Tan Xing Dao Hui Xian Shang, Mr. Mission Covenant Church of Sweden from the church, and live and do mission in this house. And the cost is 44 strings of cash. Uh, this is early 20th century documents. Uh, the yearly cost. The, anyone know how much a string of cash is nowadays? A couple of hundred RMB, I think. Something like that. Uh, this is the letter to that. Often it's disorganized, the archives. You find a box, say, oh, letters from China, and you open it and it's not letters, it's sort of plan deeds and documents, because the, the, the archivist doesn't know Chinese. Uh, I had the pleasure of going through a lot of these boxes. Uh, of course, the Swedish mission has left legacies, religious legacy, yes, there are congregations, Christian presence. People today in a local church in China might not know there were Swedish missionaries there, but still is that heritage. Uh, I will come into that soon. The Weaver and Mongolian texts, uh, the Bible translations from Swedish missionaries. Legacy of modernity, yes, we, we all know about the famous universities funded by larger mission organizations, famous hospitals, but all over China there are lots and lots of smaller clinics. It's a bit Surprising, I've seen at least three examples of how small Swedish missionary clinics are now promoted as sort of the, the, the founding uh, element of a large university hospital today. 
And then they, they really sort of bring this up. Oh, in 1893, the Swedish missionaries came to our little town and they founded this clinic named so and so, quite correctly. But and now it's a university hospital. It's nothing to do with each other, but they, they want to have this connection. And, and we don't know this in, in, in Sweden or, or in the West. We have no idea. It's all important because of the, the break after 1949 with connections to China. Uh, people sort of forgot, forgot all that happened in China mission. And in, in Sweden, the tendency is that histor historians don't, they don't work with mission studies. Missions, mi mission specialists don't work with China mission. And sonologists take no interest or think, oh, that's something, that's, that's religious things. We don't, it's Western religious things. We don't talk about that. Um, so modernity in the form of medical care, role of women, well, Women didn't have voting rights in Sweden. They, they couldn't even vote among the missionaries when they came to Sweden in the first decades. Mm. But they were still role models for Chinese women. They were, they, still, they were much free. And they had come all this way to be a teacher in China. Why couldn't a Chinese woman go somewhere and be a teacher or something else? A few examples of, of how uh, this one wonderful example of, of, of a Swedish uh, young widow, 28 years old, Anna Bari, who came to, to Actually, Huanggang, also Hubei province. I've been, I studied in Wuhan, so, so uh, I, I take them from Hubei province. And, and uh, she was the, the, the principal of a school, and they also recognized her as the first principal, and the only woman principal of that school until now. That was a Swedish missionary in Huanggang. So, modern education, uh, also, also legacy. Technology, I'll come back to this. Printing press, well, that was unusual for a Swedish mission. The cultural legacy, that's what we have here. We have kept all these records and, and material. And the personal memories, legacies so of private contacts that might be dying out when people are dead. Missionaries, there's no missionary left anymore, I think, in Sweden, who, who worked in China before 1949. The last few died a couple years ago, uh, almost 100 years old. Uh, but the legacy is still there. Uh, then, of course, Sweden has the not colonial power, uh, but of course, the, the, the so called uh, uh, unequal treaties uh, benefited also Sweden. In 1847, Sweden wrote the first, uh, made the first uh, formal agreement with the Qing uh, dynasty. Uh, a colleague of mine, Pat Kassali, at the uh, University of Michigan, has written an article quite recently that, of course, it's the, the agreement that there was, because the Chinese side never signed it, was that it was signed by Swedish uh, foreign ministry, but no copies exist where the Chinese side has signed it. But it, it was valid still for, I think, 40, 50 years or so, <laughs> until we signed a new one in 1907 or something like that. Uh, so, of course, the Swedish missionaries were sort of colonial in a sense because they went to China as representatives of the West. They didn't behave in the same way, but they had attitudes, they were prejudiced. Uh, this is an issue that, that is a bit difficult because the Swedish self-image is not of a colonial power, not at that stage. We were, of course, in the 17th century, but that's a bit further back. Uh, and how were the interactions between Swedish missionaries and, and, and and other Swedish interests. There were interests of uh, natural resources. Uh, uh, Swedes worked for the Chinese government uh, organs like the, like, like in the customs or the postal service, etc. Not just like British people or, or Americans other did. Uh, then, of course, this is the most important thing. The China mission is part of Chinese history, and Swedish China mission is part of Swedish history. And as I said, that both historians, mission scholars, and sinologists. Not only in Sweden, I would say in Nordic countries, that they all sort of distance themselves from mission studies. They love to use these materials and the photographs, but no one writes about the mission action. Uh, so we need to re reread the, the missionary publications to look for the, the golden nuggets, I would say, uh, of this eyewitness reports, uh, etc. And there's even no academic work published yet on China, Swedish China mission. None. There are a few dissertations, but there's no sort of single monograph work. There's not a dissertation. It doesn't exist, which is strange. So I have planned to write one. That's sort of part of what I'm doing here with you talking about this. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a plan. And then, again, this enormous archive material. Uh, 
Uh, yes, uh, we can talk more when you have question time. I will now go into the what I mentioned in the in the introduction to this uh, lecture. Then I will look at the few examples of peculiar emissions or specified. This is about emission to Tibetans, which is of course a rare phenomenon. Uh, in all, there have been Catholic missionaries. The only Tibetan church now is is a Catholic church. Sorry, before in in in, in uh, board between Tibetan and Sichuan. No loss. I think it's somewhere like that. Uh, there have been like, attempts from the 17th century and all to do a mission to Tibetans, mostly unsuccessful, most successful the Catholics. Uh, and China uh, Missionary Alliance, CMA, were the, those who made the most efforts, I would say, in the early 20th century. Uh, but uh, somehow they, they were in touch with Pentecostal missionaries who were Pentecostal, so of course. Often spread out, they're not they're very loosely organized, but only in Sweden, uh, mission wise. They, they didn't even have a name or organization in Sweden. They only had in, in, in China, Shenzhou, which is the name still used by uh, Assemblies of God, for example, the, the US Pentecostal large movement. And the, the, the strange thing is, you, you, you may have heard of the Azusa Street Revival in 1906 in the United States, it's the start of the Pentecostal movement at all. And a number of people involved there were Swedish Americans, and they brought this back to Sweden directly, and then they went to China. Uh, it's quite amazing to see names of people directly involved in, in this, these events. And then they, even some, some people even went directly to China, because they had this very strong uh, emotional or calling to, to do this. The difficulty of, of researching Pentecostal mission is the, the loosely organized structure. There are no central archives, large numbers, a lot of material is lost. So if they lost this one, one scholar in Sweden and the poor missionary who wrote a book in the 1990s, that's what we have. He has private collections with his family. Some is in the National Archives, but it's very, very difficult to find and see. You have to go through their publications to see names, etc. An interesting name to mention is David Landin, who was, <clears throat> he first came to China as a, a Swedish Alliance mission missionary, as many, and then they came, went back to Sweden on, on a, on a uh, leave for a year or two, and then they experienced the Pentecostal revival in Sweden, and they became Pentecostals. So when they came back to China, they were Pentecostals, and they were kicked out of their organizations, and they had to go to the Pentecostal mission. Uh, then he started a, a, a magazine, which he was the only Swedish missionary to do, I think. The Xin Shen Yu account, the Triumphs of Bain, the English Chinese magazine. Otherwise, British missionaries didn't publish very much. There are a few uh, exceptions. And then they, this couple, Elena and Torsten Halgor, here pictured with a, what is called a Tibetan priest. I think this is actually taken in the Lama Temple in Beijing, uh, in Yongogong. So it might not even be a Tibetan priest. <laughs> it could be a Mongolian. <laughs> but anyway, it's what the, the image, uh, official image uh, was written on it. Uh, but these two, uh, this couple, uh, they stumbled upon the CMA missionaries working with Tibetans, and they thought, oh, this is what we want to do. So they, they joined them. The, the CMA didn't really like Pentecostal mission for, for theological reasons, but they said, okay, we have a, the same vision, let's, let's cooperate. And they did this in Tongwen, or as they call it, Longwar, which is the, the, the Tibetan name for the temple, called Longwusu in Chinese. It's in the very, very eastern, easternmost part of Qinghai. Uh, if you can imagine Qinghai here, it's sort of here, and then Gansu is like this here. Uh, and then you have this, this area here. Uh, very harsh conditions, very difficult to work, very difficult to learn the language. Uh, I would say about 15, 20 missionaries in the British Pentecostals worked in this area until 1951. Uh, they were the first. He died while traveling back to China after a first visit to, to Sweden. Um, she then went back and came, came again to China with other missionaries. Uh, and I will, there's not many photos. So I don't have any photos from, from Tongren. Probably are somewhere, but. There are photos of the families. Uh, this couple, Anna and Albert Carlson, and these are their three children. This is from 1947, this image, before they went back to China after the Second World War. It's sort of sent out to, to congregations with the 
text to pray for Tibet. Uh, Tongren is on a high altitude. It's elevated about 2,500 meters above sea level. So it's quite high if you have come from Sweden or anywhere else to live longer times. They have very simple houses. Each time they came back from Sweden, the houses were destroyed or, or by, by local bandits or, or natural disasters. I think that they had to rebuild things over and over and over again. That's what recurring in the, 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 the letters home and so on. Uh, they distributed tracts they got from other printers. Uh, they were preaching as best they could. Uh, revival meetings, services, and they stayed until 1912. And in 1948, they had several baptisms, they write. I think it was four. And they were so happy about these four baptisms. This is one of the most difficult places to do mission in, but they still had this calling for such a long time. To read that, that uh, what they write home is, is quite interesting. They say, we reached quite many Tibetans with a word, but they seem terribly stuck. So the, 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 the language is interesting. They are stuck in a mindset. They didn't, they didn't say mind, they are stuck. They didn't say the word mind, it's not there, but we can think that they must have meant it's stuck with their own faith, stuck in their habits and whatever it is. And then they make a comment on Tibetan language. It's been a year wrestling and fighting with a beautiful but difficult to access Tibetan language. We lack good and comprehensive enough textbooks for the spoken language and teachers knowing any language that we know. This is a central phrase. The spoken and written languages are also quite different. Anyone speak or learn Tibetan here? Yeah? I traveled, I did a bit of Tibetan with you, like, in the last month, but as a bit of a background point. So, so do you agree with this? this is, anyway. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> but you do have a teacher that speaks a language you understand, right? <laughs> but they didn't, or they, they, they complained about this. But I think this very small effort to, to work among Tibetans illustrates um, the devotion of these people. I mean, this is 1947. These are not sort of, they, they probably had middle school education and they went to missionary school. They were not, they were not sort of ignorant. They, they knew that there would be harsh conditions. They knew they were going to an alien culture, so to say. Um, but they are sort of the last outpost of, of this revival movement that continued into the 20th century in Sweden. That, that sort of really it, it was a, a, a driving force for, for many of these missionaries, especially these who, who went to these more remote areas. Uh, and I think it's totally unknown today that even among Pentecostals in Sweden, if you ask them, they wouldn't know this. They might have heard these names, but they wouldn't know that there were Swedish missionaries, Pentecostals learning Tibetan and working for well, 25 years in, in Tongeren, in Qinghai province. It's totally unknown. Uh, so this is a research area, I would say. That, so if, you, if you know Swedish, you can come and look at the, whatever archive there are. So this is a, a brief thing. I have just started to look at this, but this is such a fascinating uh, uh, area, actually. Uh, uh, in, in parallel, uh, a couple of hours drive today into, uh, into Gansu, uh, around uh, a place called Jorni, uh, Jorna, I think in, in Tibetan. I don't, don't check my pronunciation there, but Jorni in, in, in Chinese, it's, it's a small xian, xian uh, not far, uh, it's a straight line, but if you go by car, maybe five or six hours. What the Swedish American uh, uh, mission uh, station uh, by the uh, China mission, the, the, the Christian Missionary Alliance, uh, who were in touch with, with these Pentecostal Swedes, and they also were in Sweden. They were sort of Swedish Americans, but were very strong links to Sweden. And they even converted a, a, a temple, the Lu, Lu Basel, into a missionary station, which is sort of, I think, unique. Tibetan uh, Lama temple that's sort of bought and converted to a, to a, to a missionary station. Uh, I think it's demolished today. It doesn't, doesn't exist anymore, but, and I haven't found any photos yet, but that, that, that's sort of, extremely uh, 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 rare and, and unusual. And of course, uh, uh, the fragmented text that I've seen uh, uh, was this uproar and, and criticism locally, of course, for this, but, but they persevered for a few decades with this. It was in 1917, they converted this. So what about the Swedish Mongol mission? <clears throat> they started, uh, in a bad way, with the three missionaries sent out just before the Box Rebellion, they were all killed. And then they restarted in 1905. 
this is an organization that inspired by Friedrich Franz and I actually did more. This, this uh, evangelist inspirer. <clears throat> they set up in what is now uh, in Mongolia. And they had four stations in Halo also, which is in Ulan Tabu or Fado uh, It is so sort of central in Mongolia. It's, I mean, it's shaped like this, so it's in, uh, right in the middle, I would say. Uh, and then they also have these other places in Shanghuan, Shanghuan Qi, Zhengwan Qi, and, and uh, Zhengxiang Bai Qi, uh, with the Mongolian names called Chagan, Hartin, Sum, Dojen, and Naimla. These are small places, a few caves or, or yurtas uh, like this one. So they, they started these stations all living in, in Mongolian tents, working from these tents, slowly, slowly building uh, brick houses. After only after a few years, um, reaching maybe baptizing 50, 100 Mongolians during a couple of decades, but each year reaching out to thousands and thousands of people with the medical. So there's a big difference there in what they wanted to do. They baptized, I would say, hundreds perhaps. But they, they, they reached out to thousands and thousands every year. They even had a, a, a tribe working in, in Urga or Ulaanbaatar. Uh, this should arrive a long time, 1919. Uh, the Chinese tried to retake Mongolia in 1917, uh, as you might know. Uh, and then in 1922, they declared, 1921, they declared independence, and 24, they were in the People's Republic, inspired by the by Soviet Union or controlled by the Soviet Union. And they were of course kicked out. They tried even with, with farming, and, and they had had good help of this man, uh, Duke Duke Larson, uh, former CMA missionary from Sweden, August Larson, who who received a kind of Duke, ducal title from from uh, the Mongolian, well, the Bogdgegen, I would say, must have been that their local ruler in Mongolia at the time. Uh, he was known in Sweden that he's, he's, he's quite well known because there was published books about him and he said he had an autobiography written in the 1940s. And there have been one or two books about him written about 10 years ago. So his name is familiar to many people. He was a missionary and then he turned into a business person or a diplomat, so to say, but he still kept connections and he worked for the British and Foreign Bible Society as the representative in Mongolia. Uh, during a number of years. And he was involved in the early. Bible translations, uh, revisions in 1910s. Uh, so he helped them to work in, in Wallenbarter, but later on he, he, he was kicked out as well, with the five of all. Uh, despite his title, didn't work well with the people. Of this is a, a parental couple. This is Jung and Eriksson uh, and his wife uh, and one of their children uh, outside the, the Ger in, in Halong Oslo in the 1910s. Uh, and in this man, you will is sort of he's sort of a character. He is he was called the great medicine man of the steppe by the locals. He claims himself at least uh, because he, he was he went to 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 uh, uh, I mentioned the, the education level of Swedish missionaries. I, I, you can count on one hand how many medical doctors were Swedish missionaries. I think there are three or something real medical doctors. Of all these 700 plus missionaries, three or four were, were trained doctors, but quite a few of them had some training. They went off into England to study uh, tropical medicine here, uh, or in Sweden perhaps, but only a short course, one term, one academic year or so, no, no proper me medical education, but they, they learned by learning by doing, practicing simple operations, etc. So he was a mechanic, he was a Bible translator, he was a medical person, you name it. So he's a, he's a good representative of this multi-talented uh, person from a small village in central Sweden that came to Mongolia, in Mongolia, and became an a, 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 a important sort of figure. This is also how long also a uh, mission station while they, when they have finished their house, it's sort of simple, you could say. Uh, with local Mongolians, uh, only a couple and another missionary. And this is him removing a bullet from the head of a bandit. That, that's the <laughs> caption stats for this photograph. Um, I'm not sure. So let, let's let's say bandit with, with quotation marks. 
but all sides, everyone came to him because there was nothing. If you lived on, on, in the Mongolian countryside, in the Mongolian countryside, there was no health care at all. You could go to a Chinese city, but they wouldn't be very, very helpful for a with the Mongolian bandit. If he was a bandit, I don't know. There's no name. The names. There's no name for this man or this man on the photo. Uh, he, he has sort of organized the photos himself when he came back to Sweden in the 1970s and 80s. So, so all captions must be taken with a sort of a pinch of salt. But uh, undoubtedly, he had a large, a great impression on, on, on the area. For today, it's mostly forgotten in the local areas. Uh, his children have gone back and, and other family members. And, and in the 80s and 90s, they traveled back to see if there's nothing there. And no houses. There are some. Uh, they found some tombstones of some missionaries who died in, uh, in the field, and they've been re-erected and, and put into some museum kind of uh, context. But elsewhere, nothing. In some of these places don't even exist anymore. Like called Chagan, I think there's nothing. It's empty. No one lives there. So if you say that, oh, this is just a sort of writing in water or something, but the photographs are there. The, the texts are there. Uh, the Bible translations are there. Uh, as I said, Duke Larson uh, was doing a revision for the British Bi Foreign Bible Society in the 1910s. Uh, then in 1935, after a sort of general meeting of all involved among in Mongolia, Mongolia missionaries, uh, they commissioned again Duke Larson, the, the medicine man, the, the mechanic, uh, to work on the new revision of full Bible. Into the world. He was later joined by the woman missionary Yara Olien, and these two, together with a Mongol called Dasta Chub, I don't know much about this man. He was a sent there are photos of him, I didn't find any of my good ones, but, but he, he, he's named, so we know this person. I don't know about his family or anything like that. Uh, they worked for 15 years or so. Uh, and when Yule Eriksson went back during the Second World War to Sweden, they sent manuscripts to and fro uh, in the Mongolia by, by mail during the Second World uh, Big chunks of, of papers looking like this. This is a, a, a draft of when, when they were sort of closing in in 1947. This is Gospel of John, the, the first, the beginning, I think it is. Uh, anyone reading Mongolian? Well, yeah, I don't know. Read the characters. <laughs> You can, well, you can see that they've, they've, they've stricken things out and they just commented. So this is a draft. And they did this during very harsh conditions. Some of them were still left in, in these uh, places in, in Mongolia, working on this translation work. Uh, he even set up uh, they, together a, a small printing uh, 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 shop uh, at Halo Mosso, where they printed sort of uh, trials and they tried them, sent them out to people who could read. Can you read this? Is this is this regular? Is this normal? Can we if this sort of could it work the Bible? Uh, I mean they only had a handful of, of congregants, uh, but they had friends who could help them. But mostly the missionaries worked together and they, they did it in a very peculiar way. Uh, in this uh, they, they were, looked at uh, the Chinese Union version, who was still quite fresh at that time, 1919. And then he, the two Swedish missionaries, they looked at the Swedish translation from 1917, who was also quite fresh at the time, and done in a very meticulous way, directly from the original texts. So they, they corroborated the Mongolian Bible version, the new revision, through the Chinese and the Swedish version, which is also quite mind boggling to, 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 to hear. Because that, that's what they could access, what they could work with. They couldn't go directly to the Greek or Hebrew texts, that would be too much work. If you also were sort of still on the field doing mission at the same time as they did. Uh, in 1947, a new missionary, Anders Martinson, came and he was directly drawn into this work. And uh, after 1949, he was commissioned to go to Hong Kong and try to, to find uh, printing possibilities, but he couldn't find any printer in Hong Kong who had Mongolian types. So they, they manufactured them. They, they, they got text from the earlier Mongolian printed texts, and they asked a, a skilled craftsman in Hong Kong to, to produce types to print. So it took a few years, but in 1953, they could print the full Bible. Um, since then, of course, there have been quite a number of new translations. It's, it's faster and easier today, but 
it's, it's an enormous work. It looks like that. This is probably more readable, the printed version. Uh, also, this is also the beginning of John, I think. Uh, so this is an astonishing story. Uh, and part of this is done by, by these um, <clears throat> British missionaries with, with particular, uh, comparatively low educational level and coming from the countryside. Not sort of what you would expect to do, be sort of the, the, the Bible translators of Mongolia. Another one, the Pentecostal missionary, Paul Kibubai, who was also a convert from Lions Mission to Pentecostal. He worked in, in uh, Bayan Post for Al Al-Salef Banner uh, for a couple of decades, and he produced, uh, after returning home to Sweden in 1955, a three-volume Mongolian English dictionary. Might be in your, in your library, I'm not sure. Uh, and the funny thing is, it, it's published by the Pentecostal uh, publishing company, Philadelphia, in Stockholm. You have uh, uh, there are not many Mongolian English dictionaries. I mean, now there are a few, but uh, there are a handful only ever produced. And one of the larger ones in modern time is produced by the Pentecostal Publishing House in Stockholm, also a bit peculiar, and funded by a Swedish cultural fund, uh, prominently exposed in, in the dictionary. And of course, no one knows about Mongolian either. No one talks about it. No one studies Mongolian anymore in Sweden. It's not possible. Uh, no one talks about it. Um, also not in Mongolia, I would say. Uh, even if Mongolia, the outer Mongolia is, of course, different today than in Mongolia. So, 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 now we come to Xinjiang, or East Turkestan, as the missionaries called it. Uh, so, I use this word here because it's uh, what the missionaries used. It was, of course, called Xinjiang already in the 1820s, formerly in 1884, which is Sometimes a bit confused with some people. It's not a new name. It's, it's well, it means a new frontier. But anyway, they call it East Turkestan. They call it what we call Uyghur Turkey or East Turkey. And the language was, of course, not Uyghur. It was Chagatai, the mother language of Uzbek and Uyghur, the temporary languages. Um, they had a, a the mission covenant church. Uh, uh, some missionaries had an idea of having mission stations. Uh, all the way from Sweden uh, to China and then back towards Jerusalem. There should be a, a string of missionary stations all through Russia, Central Asia, Xinjiang, of course, because there is Turkestan and, and in China. This was a part of this great plan. It didn't quite work out for them. They tried in Central Asia. They were in DC, for example. They were in, in, in Eastern Turkey. They were even in Iran, uh, missionaries from Sweden. Uh, and they settled in three places, in Kashgar, Yengisar, and Yarkand. From 1892 onwards, the first missionary was the man I mentioned before, Johannes Aranyan, or Mehmet Shukri, the former Mullah from Turkey, converted, uh, took an Armenian Christian name. He, he stayed there for uh, two years on his own. They baptized one person in, in, the, in the river outside or, or close to Kashgar, and started to translate the Bible. Of course, that's what you do. When you're a lone missionary in Kashgar, you translate the Bible, just like this. And he did that. He, he even, he was a major translator of the New Testament that came out in 1913. Uh, this is also one of these difficult missions. If you talk it, look at it from a Christian church perspective, they baptized maybe 400 people during 45 years. And they had three churches in these same places. Uh, but they remembered for the hospitals. Remember for the schools, the children's homes, and the printing press. I'll come to the printing press too. Um, the churches and chapels are destroyed. The only thing remaining is the English, the British consulate in Kashgar. Did you know that the UK had a consulate in Kashgar? Uh, you might have read books from the former consulate, right? But the, 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 the actual building was built by the Swedish missionaries because they had the building knowledge. Uh, it's now a restaurant called Konsul. At least when I was there the last time, 10 years ago. Uh, so I had lunch there. So it's part of the building. Is still there. It looks the same as on old photographs. It's part of a hotel, the Tiniba, the Chinese Garden Hotel. Uh, this is actually an image showing that the Chinese were, there were, of course, Chinese people also at that time in Kashgar. And this is the, in what they call the Hanchan, the Chinese 
part of the town of Kashgar. They were very much separated. The, the old part and the new part, and the new part was the, the Han. Like, <laughs> the Han people's church in, 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 in Kashgar in the 1920s, or 10s perhaps, uh, Han colored. Uh, they were quite progressive. They hired mollas for teachers in their schools who were not Christians yet to teach sort of uh, Changatai and, and other subjects. Uh, they trained local new teachers, they trained evangelists. In the 1930s, they had a, a sort of a program set up to train evangelists and, and hopefully uh, teachers and even pastors maybe, but oh, that, was, that was stopped when they had to leave in 1913 after the, the, the internal wars that broke out in 1934, 33. <clears throat> At least one Uyghur woman was trained as a midwife that worked as that later on in life uh, until, she, uh, until she retired. Uh, so they, they were a, a strange presence. Of course, it was very difficult uh, to work uh, in such an environment. When they came, the first, I would say, first 10, 15 years were quite harsh. With regular uh, the quarrels, attacks on the missionaries. They had to close themselves in into the mission stations. But then again, people came for their health care. They also had thousands and thousands of people. There are still some records left. They had to destroy some records, but there are still records kept in, in, in the National Archives in Sweden. We can see uh, even names of, of local Christians, but that's, of course, a bit more sensitive. Uh, after the... <clears throat> in 33, 34 uh, rebellions where there was established a, an uh, emirate in, in, in Kortan, the Emir of Kortan, the Bugra brothers. You have heard about these people? No? Yes. No? Yeah, something like that. <clears throat> they, they, that affected the missionaries quite, quite, quite a lot. And then a few years later, they had to leave, basically, because of the tension that was created by, by the, that rebellion. It was crushed, of course, after the months they established the even at the fight to establish a republic, the Turkestan Islamic Republic. Uh, but it didn't succeed really in that. Uh, but the, 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 the presence and what they remembered for you, in the 1980s, there are a number of stories written down by Chinese and other scholars saying that if you went to Kashgar at that time, people could talk about the Swedes. Yeah, I remember they, they cured me when I was a child. I'd broken my foot. They, 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 they fixed it, etc. Et so the, the remembrance was strong even 40 years, 50 years after they had left. Nowadays, of course, those people are gone. I happened to meet this woman, 1998, Nura. And this is Turnitsa, who was the, the midwife I mentioned. Uh, in 1967, the height of the cult cultural revolution, she wrote a letter. She thought, oh, now I've been away from the missionaries for 30 years. I, I, I needed to, to write to them. I, I wanted to, to have a connection with them. And she tried. She went to the post office and mailed this letter to the Swedish mission Sweden or something like that. I haven't seen the, the envelope, but the letter is still there in the archives. And it came to Sweden. And it was sent to missionaries who were still alive at that time. And they established contact. 1967. This is quite unusual. So after 20 years, when, when Martin Douglas was dead and she could travel. She came to Sweden in 1985, and she traveled all around the country giving these lectures about her life, etc. And what she could see was still left of oh, oh. Christians. Uh, so an astonishing story. Uh, this was her friend. Uh, they were both at the so-called children's home. It was not an orphanage. They had parents, but they were still left there for schooling and training and, and for protection, I, I would say. From, from society in London. Uh, and the, the parents were apparently friendly with the missionaries. Uh, she was still alive in 1998 when I came to Kashgar. And then Yarkin, sorry, she lived in Yarkin, where she grew up, and this image is from Yarkin as well. She passed away in 2001, I think. She could still speak a few words of Swedish, actually. She knows some songs from that period, astonishingly. Uh, Another interesting aspect of this mission was to Muslims. I mentioned the, the but there was another one, Yosef Mestre or Melissa Gazin Khan, who's a Persian medical doctor who met a Swedish woman missionary while working in, in, in Tehran, uh, yeah, in Tehran in, in the 1890s. They fell in love. Uh, to avoid, <laughs> probably to avoid sort of suspicion, because they were really 
having a relation before they were married, uh, they were sent to Kashgar and married in Kashgar. So they, sort of, they saved them by sending them to Kashgar. And of course, he was a former Muslim. He could easily talk to the, and he was a doctor, so he could easily. And they established the, the, the medical mission in, in Yengisar uh, between uh, Kashgar and Yadgan. Then they went back to Persia and he died sadly quite early, but uh, astonishing to have two former missionaries, uh, two, two former Muslims as missionaries, and then trusted them even to start a new work in a new town like Yengisar. And one meet to Yengisar, they have this wonderful small knights. They're well known for their, their peculiar small knights still today. Uh, small town still today uh, between Yarkan and Kashkar. This is not common among missions to, to employ uh, converts as missionaries sort of after two years after their conversion. This is a bit un unusual, but they, everything with this particular mission is unusual. The, the place, the, the, the work they did, they translated a lot of material into Uyghur uh, or Chagatai. Uh, you should say Chagatai because Uyghur is the modern version that came in the 30s and onwards. Uh, I will soon show you. Uh, they had a printing press and they, they had an enormous publication on all kinds of things. They, they put together the teaching materials for the schools uh, based on Swedish school books, mostly. Uh, of course, they just did Bible tracts. Uh, they had almanacs, they had even literature. I will show you an example of that. Uh, after they left in 1938, mostly, most Christian men were killed. And Christian women were married off to Muslims. A few survived in, in a sense. According to her, some Uyghur men did survive, Christian men, and, and the, some families kept their faith all the way through this, these years until the times were better in the 1980s again. Uh, and she could tell stories about this when she came to Sweden in 1985. Um, so there's a lot more to dig, dig out from, from these stories. Um, Another Bible translation, it is a horrible picture, but it's from a, a I couldn't find a better one at the moment. Uh, these photographs are not really tight, so you have to go into the archive somewhere far off and, and dig it out, but it's from a, from a print. But Oscar Herrmann, so the unspoken hero of Uyghur Bible translation, Chagatai Bible translation, probably one of the persons knowing Chagatai best in his time. He published the, the Chagatai hymnal for the church work. Primary Bible translation of the whole Bible, first New and Old Testaments. Uh, he translated Nobel laureates, Sen Malag Lerb and Henrik Sinkiewicz. I saw that this book in the office, uh, Lars, for what is. But there is an Uyghur, uh, the Chinese high version. Uh, it didn't, I mean, it wasn't a big seller. They didn't sell much of this because they sold these books, but but they did it. I mean, they, I think they barely printed it and they had to leave. So was it, but the effort was there. They they did as I said, hymnal for the church work, the, the Bible translations, but also literary works. So this it's hard to, to imagine how you can sit in, in Kashgar or Yarkan working on, on these uh, literary translations into a language that, that you're not sure that it's changing, it's 1930s, it's a modernization, the deed education, uh, it, it's a turning into something else. people are not using Tagatai anymore. But still do it. He was sentenced to death by the Emir of Kota, Abdullah Bura, in 1933, with two other missionaries. And they were saved in the very last minute. Uh, uh, so he, he was almost sort of pulled out on, 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 the, on the courtyard to, to be shot. And then, then they, someone intervened, and, and then they could, they could leave the, the premises. They were in turn for quite a while. Uh, The printing press started in 1912. It was uh, transferred on train as far as they could, and then on, 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 uh, uh, on camels and horses through the, the, the mountains into Xinjiang from, from Central Asia, from, from uh, Uzbekistan, I think. Uh, but they had a simple thing called a sickle style, like, a, like a, a simple copying machine. From 1901, and this is the first print they did. It still exists if you copy it in, in, in the archives in, in Stockholm. It's the whole history, so it's sort of a collection of uh, Bible stories. Uh, anyone read Chagatai? 
No, I, I don't either, so I just, if someone, but it, of course it, it's, it's Arabic letters. So you could probably read it out. Last is trying, I can do that. Um, and they printed lots of things. I mean, the, the printing press worked, as we know, at least until the 1970s. Of course, not with the missionaries, because they left 1938, but what happened from 38 to the early 70s. And it was printing the Kashka Riva, the Kashka Daily, the Communist Party newspaper in Kashka. Of course, even the Kuomintang grabbed the, the, the machinery in 1938 and used it for, for their purposes. So it's, a, it's probably printed lots and lots of things. But later years, a new local newspaper. Uh, I mentioned the 1913 uh, New Testament. The Bible was finished only in 1950, printed in Cairo, outside of China. A few copies reached. They managed somehow to transport into China, despite 1949 and the communist takeover. Uh, so, wonderful stories about that. It says Kashkai. <laughs> Kashkai. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine that. But um, the Bible didn't have the effect. They, they I mean, the New Testament, yes, but, but the full Bible, a few copies, I would say, entered China again in 1950. We know that some people received it uh, from, from notes, etc., and, and communication. But uh, for scholars, it, it's. They, they created an autography for, for Chaga, if you can say. This is, so they, 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 the Bible had set sort of standard for writing, uh, in a sense. I mean, there were standards for writing, of course, not before that, but sort of late Chaga Thai uh, autography is sort of a creation of the Swedish missionaries, you could say. They were forced to print things, newspapers, during the, 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 what, the, the Emirates. They even printed money for the, 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 this Eastern Islamic Republic. Uh, and they were out of paper. So there, there are a, 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 a limited series of money printed on, on cloth by the Swedish Mission Press in Kashka. Very rare. A few copies still exist. Uh, so, so, so they were accused, of course, of all things from most Kuomintang and the communists later on that there were spies for Russia, Soviet Union for Britain, uh, for the other side, Kuomintang or the communists, uh, or even for something else, uh, because they printed for everyone, but they were, of course, forced to do it. Uh, there was not, you could say a lot about the, the British consulate in Kashgar, but, uh, uh, and they were friendly with, with the Swedish missionaries, of course, but, but I, I, I doubt there were, there were sort of connections of, of sort of information in that sense, involuntary, perhaps. Another example, they're very, very popular, many editions, ABC book, how to learn the language. Um, yeah. Uh, Hindu, I mean, fast, of course, it's Swedish as well, but it is. Um, and if you, if you would see this hymnal, you would recognize some of the hymns because they are the same hymns as you would sing in, in a Swedish church or in a British church, some of them. It was one of Ben Hur, not not very good literature, perhaps, but but uh, but it's a sort of a, this is sold quite well. I I I have been told that there are many copies of this one. Uh, the calendar was was the, the centerpiece that it was sold in in large copies. Yeah, it's thirteen whatever it is, thirteen to twenty, some thirteen fourteen. 1353. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. 1936. Yeah. So now it's, it's the two years. Yeah, right. Uh, wearing of silk clothes. So an endless different. This is also with Russian and Chinese and uh, English even. Uh, so they had a sort of Civilizing uh, uh, aspect of their work as well, besides the actual mission work. Uh, special case in the Xinjiang mission was this woman. I also, I apologize for the photos. There aren't any even good photographs of her. She came out as a missionary, uh, but she was already 35 years old. She lived in, in her, uh, on a farm with her family, uh, working as a farmhand. Some shops in the nearest town, Kalskuga, if anyone knows it, in, in central Sweden. 
But her family are well-known missionaries and church leaders. Her cousin uh, founded the, the Evangelical Covenant Church in the U.S., for example, uh, in the 1880s. One of her brothers was a missionary in Africa. But she didn't have this idea until she was 35, and then she went to Kashkin. Uh, she also had a nurse training. <clears throat> she, her life was quite well. She learned the language quite well, quite quickly. Uh, but after about 10 years, she had been home in Sweden for a, a period, 1906-07. The other missionaries thought she was a bit close to her chef and, and, her, her, and a friend, her, 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 her a servant, Dr. Uh, and they, they claimed things that they were, had secret meetings and they saw them kissing, etc. Et uh, according to her own writings, there was nothing until they started the rumors, and then she thought, oh, why not? I could kiss him or something like that. <laughs> and, and they lived together for more, on and off for 20 years. Uh, they might have, might mar have married in, in Osh. Um, she was supposed to go home to Sweden in 1912. She traveled to Osh instead, stayed there, and he came there, and they married. Uh, the sources are a bit vague, and it's difficult to know what kind of marriage. There are instances of marriages between Christians and Muslims in Central Asia. During the time, it's possible, but we don't know. He had been married before, he had children, he didn't have any children, but they lived together for on and off until the mid-1920s when he took a, a new wife. Uh, and then she had enough of him, but they were still very friendly the rest of the, her life. Uh, there are wonderful stories of how they lived together in Kucha, uh, in northern Xinjiang, Kucha in Chinese. And they have apricot trees and they eat one melon a day or two melons a day from their own, uh, 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 etc. And they have donkeys and horses and cows and they live a good life. And she was, of course, a medical uh, nurse. So she could sell her medical services to people. And they had a good life for a couple of years together in Kucha. Then his children went into drug abuse. They smoked, and he did as well, opium. And she, she fought a lot to, to care for them. We know all this because of her letters back to her sister and the family in Sweden. There are, it's, it's not a full collection, but it's a, I think there are five volumes of letter copies in the archives. And this is a completely amazing read to, to read through this. Uh, he died on the way back to Sweden on the train uh, outside of Skyping. Uh, she was buried in Moscow. Uh, no one went to see her grave until the 1980s. So one of our family members got permission to travel and see. So it's in one of the uh, uh, cemeteries in Moscow where they have. Uh, Evangelical cemetery. I think there are one or two cemeteries. I don't remember which one, but I haven't been there. Uh, she's having a this is a, a tomok, I think, a kind of fur uh, that usually men have actually. And then she has an atlas. This is taken in Sweden when she was back because she went around and, and just told the stories about life in Xinjiang. You can look into, into a newspaper advertising from the time and see that she appears in. Kashka dress and so on. Um, oh, I'm talking too much. <laughs> I didn't say anything about time. No, I, I mean, <laughs> sorry, I, I, I couldn't do it. Uh, anyway, some final things. I haven't come to the communists yet. Uh, this is a, a find from maybe 10, 12 years ago in the, in the archives, in the Mission Covenant Church archives. Embroidered cloth. Uh, with applique characters in the hand of uh, Liu Bi, the Chinese, the Han Chinese commander of Kashgar, 1930s. Also signed, so to say, by Mahmoud Shijang, Ma Mahmoud, and Ma Shao. I think might be familiar to some of you, from the Ma clan, uh, Sufi family, Lakshpandi in Sufi family. Uh, but he was the, the Hui, the Dungan, uh, 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 military commander of, of, of Kashgar. And they all thank the Swedish capital. Mm. Uh, so, uh, well, great mates benefit society. So they, they were happy. They, of course, they treated probably Mahal was, but they tried to execute him and he was heard that he was treated by the Swedish missionaries. Uh, and also the other ones had, had an accident. The Opin was a Christian, the, 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 the Han Chinese general. Uh, 
um, an astonishing find. It has been rolled up for, for many decades and rediscovered only in the early 20, uh, 2000s. Some photos. This is the mission station in Kashgar, also part of the station. It looks like this today. You see that the, the trees are the same. This is from 2010 when I was there. Uh, this is the gate. It's called, of course, a Jinshu, one issue. Uh, so I think that yeah, I couldn't even peek in. Uh, it's the Wudrapu, the, 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 yeah, the local militia of Kashgar has it set for it. Mm -hmm. Supposedly there are no buildings left, but maybe some trees. I don't know. The same kind of trees, at least. But no one has been in there because it's been a military area since 1949. We don't know. But that's where the printing press was. This is the church in Yakan, uh, after service. Um, there's no cross, as you see, but it looks like something. It's a different kind of building. You can see that. Um, children's home in Yakan. With some children. Or children. Look at the these wooden beams and the uh, the what's it called the the canal Canalation. Canalation, yeah, the same. Yeah, whatever. This is my own photo from 1998. This is what it looks like. Well, it, I don't. I, I think it's demolished now. I haven't been there. I didn't find it last time of that 2010. But this is the same building. Uh, inside the building, the people live in there. Uh, there was a Alu uh, is called like a, a, a kind of cupboard, uh, like, like a cupboard you can handmade cupboard you can find in any Swedish rural household in the 19th century in the corner or freestanding, like, like, like a cupboard for things, for food, painted in a blue color, and it was inside this book. It must have been made by the missionary. For food? Well, you can put the, the, the plates and things like that. Oh, yeah. Not for food. Like, like a typical cupboard of Swedish style from the late 19th, early 20th century. And in 1998, I think it was still in this period. I, I, I've heard it's demolished. I, I don't know. I was in your country in 2010, the last time. But uh, I, difficult to find these places because this is, they had two sites in your country. And no one still quite remembers which is which. So, so it's difficult. This is close to the former mental hospital in Yaka, but it's not, even that is not there anymore. So it, it becomes more and more difficult to find these things. But I've seen this at least. So it, it's, this is quite astonishing. So, you want to hear about the communists and missionaries? Is it enough? Yes. <laughs> no, I, I found something by chance. Uh, some years ago, uh, I was looking at this missionary, Sam Krull, uh, who worked for the Lutheran College that I mentioned in Church of Sweden uh, in Wuhan, then at the Buddhist Memorial School in Wuhan and the Central China University, which is now the Pardon Shri Pandasu, the, the Central China Normal University. Uh, and among his students, uh, I, I, I went through his book collection. He had about a thousand books in Chinese and other languages. And I found this suddenly. It's the, the commented Shi Ji. Uh, and it's at Han Xian Shan Hui Sun, Xia Zhang Bo Hong the Ding Sun. So, uh, gorgeous gift to, to, to teach uh, Shuld from, from the student Bo Hong the. So, I, I Googled this name, Bo Hong the. It's the name that's well known. And I found it was. It was the Minister of Education in the People's Republic of China in 1960s. But he's changed his name to Huawei. In 1936. This is signed in, 19, in September 1935. Five months later, he joined the Communist Party and changed his name to Huawei. Uh, and I, I've seen other documents and, and bits and pieces that show that they were friendly long after he joined the Communist Party. And I, when I got this name, I started sort of searching and searching and searching through any available sources, and I found there were at least three of students that became communist. Uh, at the same time, uh, Chen Xingchun and uh, uh, Huang Xuexin. Uh, Huang Xuexin also left notes in, in his book collection. He was called Huang Haibin later as a communist. He died prematurely of cancer, but he, he got a, a memorial in the People's Daily, the national newspaper. So he, he, he had a 
Korea very similar to you know Bo Yibo. Uh, Bo Xi Lai's father. And they were born the same year, Wang Haibin and Bo Yibo. And Bo Yibo was the head of the 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 organization department in the northeast. And Wang Haibin was in the central south area. They had exactly the same career until he suddenly died in 1915. Uh, so he could have become one of the, the, the big leaders, but he suddenly died. But on the back of this, this uh, name card, there's a long text about, very friendly text about, I think about books actually, uh, sending books, because they all work with, uh, with uh, uh, what is now the Sanli and Shu Dian. You know, this, this, uh, there, there was a, a chain of bookstores, and there was very strong in Wuhan. They had several outlets, and all these three, uh, well, at least two of them worked there, doing uh, secret underground Communist Party work. And then I found it uh, uh, by chance also, you know, Li Rui, uh, Mao Zedong's secretary for a while in the 50s, also the national head of the, of the organization department, and the minister for water uh, projects and so on. And then he died 101 years old a couple of years ago. He wrote in his recollections that in Wuhan, in the 1930s, when he was there, they often used church premises because of friendly missionaries who allowed them to meet, sometimes under the pretext of having a church meeting, to organize Communist Party activities. I haven't found a straight connection with some or the Swedish missionaries, but some missionaries in Wuhan, in, even in either Hanko or Wuhan, uh, did work with exactly, the, and he mentions all these three students of Sankhurt, theory specifically points her way out as he was the central organizer. Uh, this is something I would like to, uh, to explore further. But it's difficult to find. Because this, is, this is something stuck into a book, a name card. Uh, and that's how I have found it. And they write things on books. So uh, we can skip to view. <laughs> Final Im image, what you can find in an archive. Related to Swedish missionary. This is sort of quite exceptional. Probably worth lots of money. It's a calligraphy by Duan Bang, the Viceroy of Wuhuang and, and Liang Jiang, uh, an important uh, Qing Dynasty official. Uh, he was killed in 1911. Uh, he was one of these Han who became a Manchu. He joined the, his family joined the bandit, but he had only a Han background. He met one of the MCCS founders. Baldenstrom, at least twice. Once when he went came to Sweden, he was part of this official group of uh, uh, Qing uh, scholars sent out to, to Europe to look at different uh, uh, kinds of uh, government in, in the West. So he came to Sweden, and they became friendly. And then Baldenstrom came to China, and they met again. And he gave him this this his own calligraphy with with a. A rubbing or of something Egyptian that he he, he was a big art art and curio, curio collector, but from the greatest of his time, probably in China. And this is rolled up in, in an archive in Sweden. I, I couldn't believe my eyes. I, I realized this is actually his own handwriting, and his stamp is a Kao Kao Dai, which you know, always used on his own writing. Because his original Chinese name was Tom. Uh, his calligraphy sells for tens of thousands of people. So he was friendly enough with this Swedish missionary founder to give him a, his own living. Unusual. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you.